James Swanick here. Welcome to the Alcohol Free Lifestyle Podcast. And today, our top coach, Victoria English, is interviewing her father, Bob English, who is an 83 year old man who's been alcohol free now for 42 years. And Bob is a business owner, a former Iron Man. He's a husband, dad, and grandfather. And he says that he nearly surrendered to the grips of alcohol many years ago, but he's turned his life around and he's 42 years alcohol free, which is incredibly inspiring. I'm running into so many people these days who are choosing alcohol free. I'm recording this right now from Bali, Indonesia, and uh, I just met someone yesterday who has been alcohol free for two years. And a lot of my new acquaintances or friends here are either alcohol free and have been for a good year or two, or they have a drink on occasion. So I'm not sure whether this area of the world attracts that type of person, but I am just noticing so many more people who are attempting this, doing this, and choosing to live an alcohol-free lifestyle. I'm having a look on CNN.com at the moment. I'll go on to FoxNews.com as well, just so I've got the left and the right, <laughs> so no one can accuse me of bias. But it's interesting, all these things in the world. CNN's headline is, this invisible gas could seal our fate on climate change. And they're talking about, um, there was a big report coming out about climate change. New Zealand is slowly reopened to the world from early 2022. Tom Hanks' son is ranting against vaccines despite parents' COVID battles. There's a story about sex in the city being back. There's a story about cryptocurrency, $600 million of crypto being gone. Let's flip over to Fox News now. Fox News is saying, cops feel under attack as Democratic mayor defends call to rush, send off for slain officer. I don't even know what that means. Andrew Cuomo or Cuomo, the New York governor, just resigned yesterday as I'm recording this. President Biden refusing to release visitor logs from Delaware despite his frequent trip. I mean, all this stuff that's going on, I'm telling you, where is all the stories? Where are all the stories about alcohol, about the damaging effects of alcohol? And I, I, I know that you will feel inspired by this upcoming interview with uh, Bob English, Coach Victoria's father, because he made the choice 42 years ago to give up alcohol and completely transformed his life. And his daughter, Victoria, who's now working in my organization as the top coach of um, Project 90, got to benefit from that. And her daughters got to ben get to benefit from their grandfather or Victoria's father. But I'm looking at CNN and foxnews.com and I'm not seeing anything here around all the damaging effects of alcohol. I'm not seeing things here about people trying to encourage people to reduce or quit alcohol. It's all political fighting and infighting and, you know, not that these stories aren't important that they're, that they're publishing. They are, but surely talking about the damaging effects of alcohol and the inspiring effects of alcohol if you stop drinking it should be more prominent in our media today. But anyway, that's my little uh, somewhat of a rant over. Uh, if you would like to get my daily email, you can go to alcoholfreelifestyle.com forward slash guide and I will send you my alcohol freedom formula. It's the same process that I've been walking through our clients um, through in Project 90. Uh, that's a free guide. If you go to alcoholfreelifestyle.com forward slash guide, I will send you that free guide and you will end up getting my daily email. If you don't like daily emails from me, don't do it. So just a warning. Having said that, my daily emails are pretty awesome, I think. Lots of knowledge bombs <laughs> talking about health and wellness and all kinds of things. Uh, likewise, if you would like to speak with Coach Victoria, who you're going to hear on this podcast, uh, and potentially join us in Project 90, then you can do that by going to alcoholfreelifestyle.com forward slash schedule where you can book a call. And if you want some more details about Project 90 in general, you can go to alcoholfreelifestyle.com forward slash Project 90. Okay, enough from me. Let's get into today's episode with Victoria English, the inspiring Victoria English, I should say, interviewing her inspiring father, Bob English. Hi, everyone. This is Victoria English, top coach with Project 90. I am once again taking over James's podcast, and I have a very special guest today, uh, very special to me, and I think by the end of this episode, he will be special to you as well. I am interviewing my father, Robert English. He goes by Bob. Uh, I've known him, well, all my life, <laughs> and he has an incredible story, which some of our 
current uh, Project 90 members know a little bit about. And he just the little bit that they know has inspired all of us so much that I was asked to interview him. So please welcome Bob English, my dad. Hi, daddy. Hi, sweetheart. And hello to everybody. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for being here. So uh, I live out in Denver. My dad lives in Lakeland, Florida, a little town between Tampa and Orlando. That's where I grew up from age, I think, four to 17. Uh, and yeah, we're just going to talk a little bit about your life, your story, and um, how giving up alcohol changed just about everything for you. So let's start with uh, just a little bit about your background. Where'd you grow up? What was your childhood like? Things like that. Okay, well, I was born in uh, 1938, uh, 83 years old. I was born in the coal regions of Pennsylvania, Frackville, PA, and I had three brothers growing up and four sisters, so we had a large family. Uh, my father died when I was uh, 10 years old, uh, but he actually left for the TB sanitarium when I was eight, so I knew him up until I was eight years old. He was a uh, a uh, strong disciplinarian, uh, but I remember him being that. But uh, I have some warm memories of him going out picking huckleberries and him watching me pitching ball games and so forth. But uh, I didn't have him to help me grow up, but I did have my brothers, and they, they looked out for me. And all in all, we were a very happy family. My mother did a good job of raising us. We had a, a strong ties to each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know family was always very important to you. And um, as your daughter growing up, I could, I could see the pain of, of growing up without your dad. And um, I'm sure that was incredibly difficult. Um, when you uh, graduated from high school, I know you went into the service. Uh -huh. uh, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, yes, I joined the Coast Guard in 1956, and um, for most of that service time, I spent it on an icebreaker, the USCG Westwind, and uh, I made three trips to the North Pole, the Arctic Circle, and one long trip to uh, the Antarctic. And uh, in the service, I, uh, I learned one thing in the service I thought uh, was important, that we had 175 people crewmen on that ship and uh, we were black and white, Latinos, Filipinos, and uh, everybody got along. Everybody liked each other. We were a good crew. And it, it just gives me hope for, for the world that if people get together, uh, most people are good hearted mm -hmm. and want to get along. And uh, that was proven to me on that ship. So uh, that was a good lesson I learned in the service. and. Mm -hmm. uh, Looking back, it was some of the most enjoyable. It was one of the most enjoyable periods of my life. Mm, I bet. I do know, though, that uh, those trips to all those cold places are the reason that I grew up in Florida. <laughs> that I, I was down in the Antarctic. It was 40 below. I was uh, using a blowtorch to heat up nails so I could pound them into the wood without them breaking. They got so brittle. And the thought crossed my mind, when I get out, I'm going to go someplace for him. <laughs> and you did. And you did. So, um, you know, it, I, I, I don't know what the culture was around alcohol when you were growing up um, and came of age and when you were in the service and everything. But I would imagine there was a lot of drinking going on with you and the guys. Well, uh, I started actually I had my first beer in high school. And that was uh, driving around uh, in the back seat, buying a quart of beer and going to the drive-in and things like that. Uh, but it wasn't anything serious. It didn't, didn't affect me at all. Uh, and then when I got into the service, um, that, that was a drinking atmosphere. Fortunately for me, uh, being on an icebreaker, I was gone uh, for the in the Antarctic, almost seven months, and it was a three-month uh, trip up to the North Pole. So I spent a lot of time on board ship and didn't have the opportunity to drink. But uh, when we got uh, on shore, that was part of our lifestyle was drinking. Mm -hmm. 
And I was young and healthy and strong, and I could drink till the early morning and wake up six o'clock and do a full day's work and just let it go. You know, I thought I'm okay. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. I think that happens to a lot of us in our 20s. We think, uh, well, you know, nothing, no, no real consequences other than maybe a hangover, a headache, and yeah. feeling a little queasy, but you can get through it. So, so then after, after the service, uh, you put yourself through college. You got married to my mom. Tell us about mm-hmm. that and, and where, um, what kind of role alcohol was playing in your life at that point? Well, when I get out of the service, I, uh, I got, uh, actually got a job as a salesperson. I've always worked more or less by myself all during my life. And uh, mm-hmm. I sold vacuum cleaners and sewing machines and uh, door to door and uh, made a lot of money doing it, actually. Saved enough money to uh, go to school and uh, use the GI Bill. Then when I got out of um, college, I went to work for a manufacturing company for a while and uh, then decided to be a manufacturer's rep myself. And that eventually led me into finding, founding my own company, Valiant Products, Inc. And uh, I did that with um, little capital. And uh, that's when drinking first appeared to be a problem. I would I would get stressed out and so forth, and I would come home and 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 drink. Uh, I wasn't a person that went to the bars that often. I mostly uh, drank at home. Uh, but then, as children got over that got got older, then I then I did start going to the bars. I didn't want to drink at home in front of them. Mm-hmm. Um, but. Um, I struggled with drinking and I knew I had a problem and uh, it was just, um, I I couldn't, I I didn't get drunk every day. I wasn't a drinker every day, but I would go on binges Mm -hmm. and, um, um, and I look back and think how many times I drove a car and I just thank God to this day that I never hit anybody, Mm -hmm. but um, I was, I was giving up hope. I, I thought, what's going to happen to me? I'll always be able to make some money, but I'm probably going to end up uh, living in some cheap hotel room all by myself, and I'll probably die of cirrhosis of the liver. Mm-hmm. And um, then I had a DUI, and um, I remember the judge, uh, I was found guilty of the DUI. I went to court thinking I was going to beat it, which was just my ego Mm -hmm. getting in the way. And um, the judge told me, she said, uh, she said, Mr. English, you are a pathological liar and a drunk. And you Mm -hmm. better face up to it. And she sent me to this psychiatrist and he interviewed me on my drinking and every question he asked, and you know the normal questions, does yeah. this interfere with your life? Does this do that? I lied in every case. I don't oh, know, not me. And I was driving back from that interview with the psychiatrist, and I said, you know, that judge is right. I mm-hmm. am a pathological liar. The definition being that I believe my own lies. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that was a, a lesson learned, but I didn't quite learn my lesson and uh, continued to drink. And uh, one time I came home, uh, had a tussle with my son, not anything serious, but uh, I knew I knew that was that was inexcusable. I went to bed. Uh, my wife, your mother, woke me up and said, "You're either going to get better or." We're leaving with the kids. I'm leaving with the kids. So uh, that day I, I called AA. I went to AA. And uh, that was the start of it. I never had a drink since then. That was 42 years ago. Mm. But um, uh, I really was determined I was going to quit this because um, I had a full life ahead of me. I had a, a world full of opportunities. And it was wouldn't be fair to my children or myself or or my family to continue what I was doing. So that was my incentive mm-hmm. to get better. And mm-hmm. um and I did. 
And it was, I still to this day say, um, other than other than having my children, the most important day of my life was the day that I quit drinking alcohol. Yeah. And uh, it opened up a whole new world for me. Yeah. I, um, well, I've told you, I remember that day very, very clearly because I was, I was still young, uh, but it was, I was old enough that I understood what was happening. Um, I knew that if mom put, put tin foil over your plate and put it in the fridge that you weren't coming home. Uh, I knew that, you know, our, my brother was going to, you know, try to defend us and that it was going to be messy. And I just remember that heaviness in the house. Um, and I didn't understand it because I was, I was still young and I just thought, well, why is it like this? Why is, why is daddy one person when he comes home and a different person the next day? And, um, there was just this darkness. And I remember that day when mom took us to the, to the room and said that to you. And I was so scared, so scared because I had remembered the times that you had told me it would stop and it didn't. Um, but I remember that day you, you picked up the phone and I guess you called AA and that was it. And Mm -hmm. I've told my dad for our listeners, I don't know if you remember this dad, but, uh, do you remember the letter I wrote to you? Mm-hmm. And I wrote a letter to my dad later in my life. I don't know how old I was, but I said to him, I said, I said, daddy, my dad's done a lot of things for me. He's provided an incredible life. Uh, I've, I've never wanted for anything. Um, but I wrote him a letter and I said, the, the greatest gift that you ever gave me was to stop drinking. Mm-hmm. And I, I believe that to this day because my dad's 83 years old. Last week, he went to Philadelphia with me. I went for a, a monitoring uh, for my breast cancer that I had a few years ago. And here he is, 83 years old, wearing a, a Rocky Balboa wig. <laughs> and he's running up the Rocky steps with, with me and my 13-year-old daughter, his granddaughter, Aubrey. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Those are the gifts that this is my next question and, and we'll talk about this, but there are gifts that when you give up drinking, you think that you're just giving up the alcohol, but the, the intangibles are so numerous that you can't even begin to dream of them when you stop drinking. So when you stopped drinking, because I remember you telling me later, years later that, you know, you thought alcohol had you in such a grip in its grip so badly that it was going to take you out, like you said. And my dad had arranged for my mom, my brother and I to have, you know, enough money that we would be okay. But he felt so hopeless that he had just sort of made that arrangement and almost resigned himself to that fate. Mm -hmm. So listening, just, you know, if you're in the grips of it, we get it. We understand. And I hope you'll enjoy my dad's story because it doesn't have to be that way. No, no, it doesn't. And um, I remember, I remember when I when I left that AA meeting, it was like a, a big boulder was lifted off my shoulders. So uh, mm-hmm. I didn't feel like that afterwards. I said, "There is hope. I can yeah. make it." And uh, and. Uh, I just had that faith and uh, mm-hmm. it just renewed my life. Uh, yeah. I could remember uh, start, I had my own business and I was afraid to make appointments with people. They'd say, uh, well, meet me at one o'clock after lunch. So, and so, and I'd say, say to myself, oh, boy, I don't know if I'm going to be sober that day. Uh-huh. Yeah, I just better tell them I'll call them when I'm, when I'm in the area or something yeah. like that. I mean, that's how, that's how, dumb it became that I couldn't even oh, make yeah. an appointment with people. Uh-huh. And here I am running a business with employees and having to meet a payroll. And I'm I'm doing things like that. How, how stupid can you be? Right. And uh, so all that changed, of course. Yes, thankfully. <laughs> and, and 
energized and mm -hmm. and it paid off. It sure did. Well, you know, the thing is when, when people are drinking um, and they find themselves doing those sorts of things, those ridiculous things that, that when you look back, they, they seem just so absurd. Like, wait, I actually scheduled my day around drinking. Yeah. You know, I remember, I remember not making things like dentist appointments on Mondays because I was afraid I would smell like wine. <laughs> you know, like everything was just sort of in a, in a, in a way, just sort of tied to that habit. Yeah. And um, the freedom that you find when you give it up is, is amazing. But you know, what I, what I coach about is things like that drive us further into shame. And mm -hmm. what does shame do? It makes us want to drink more because that's mm -hmm. such a painful thing to sit with. But, you know, we're talking about alcohol, which is one of the most highly addictive substances that you can ingest. Mm -hmm. And so it net, it is going to change your, your behavior. It's going to be, it's going to change how you view the world and how you interact with everything and everybody. So mm -hmm. when you see that for what it is, and you can say, okay, it's not that I'm a bad person. It's not that I don't love my family. It's not that I don't value my health or my career. It's that you ingested enough of this highly addictive thing that mm. this is the outcome. So when you can release that, then you can get on with the business of getting better and living. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. When you stopped drinking, um, I would imagine that AA was about the only option. That was the only option at the time, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, but um, I enjoyed it. I mean, I met I met people from every socioeconomic level, and um, it. Um, I think one of the things you have to be if you're going to be successful is you have to practice humility, and um, you have to get rid of your ego, mm -hmm. and you have to admit to yourself what you are. You're a drunk, mm -hmm. and. Uh, no matter whether you make $100,000 a year or $20,000 a year, you have that in common. Mm -hmm. and, but I, I met several uh, uh, professionals in, in AA, and we mm -hmm. formed a friendship outside of the uh, AA meetings. Unfortunately, they're all gone now, mm -hmm. but, uh, but uh, they were a big help. We, we mentored each other and, and held mm -hmm. each other accountable. So that was a good thing too. Yeah. Yeah. That's nice that you did that. And um, yeah, you can, you can make those kinds of friends and it does help to have that, that, that thing in common that, you yes. know, the drinking thing, because you can talk freely and you understand each other. Mm -hmm. um, you understand what it's like to go to an event where there's yeah. going to be alcohol and you're not drinking. Um, you understand what it's like when people question you, like, so did you give it up like for real, for real? <laughs> uh, or is this just a phase? Um, uh, yeah. And that's, you know, as you know, I've told you about what we do here at project 90 and how we coach around all of those things, because you don't have to do it alone. Giving up drinking is a big, is a big deal. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad today in 2021 that there are options. You can do project 90, you can do AA, find something that fits, mm -hmm. but find something. Right. And take it serious. Take mm -hmm. it serious. Yeah. Yeah. So you put the alcohol down and mm -hmm. uh, you told me that you felt like a lot of us and, and we coach around this too. Like, what do you do with that vacuum that forms you know suddenly you have more time you have more energy you have more money because <laughs> you're not spending it on alcohol yeah. and you um, lose pounds right away oh yeah you lose some weight you're feeling good and then sometimes people are sitting there kind of twiddling their thumbs like well what do i do now so when that happened to you what did you do well i started uh exercising and running and that became a passion of mine and uh We'd go to the races together and I'd be the designated driver because they always serve beer after the races and uh -huh. uh, had any. So I was the designated driver and I would just chuck to myself uh, driving that car. But um, 
that's what I did. I, I did running and exercise and so forth and just enjoyed the competitiveness of it and uh, met a lot of new friends there too. So mm -hmm. it was a good thing for me. But I could have never done that if I was drinking. Oh, never. yeah. Yeah, for sure. I remember, uh, I remember when you'd mow the lawn, you'd be exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. I would be. Yeah. So as your, as your daughter, um, here I am watching my dad, you know, suddenly he's not drinking anymore. He's coming home and things are getting better. And then he takes up this running habit and, <laughs> you know, this is an, again, for our listeners, this is just an example of how putting down that one thing impacts not just your life, but your family's life. I, you know, I was inspired by my dad. Um, and so I got into fitness. Then I went to college. I was so inspired by his healthy eating that I studied dietetics and exercise physiology. I went on to have, I've had a career in wellness for 30 years. So again, you know, when you think about the impact you're having on your own life, you never can anticipate the ripple effect and mm -hmm. the life you're going to change by giving up that one thing that mm -hmm. I understand how big it feels. It feels like a big thing, but like my dad said, it, when you let it go, it feels like a boulder has been lifted off of you. Yes, it has. Yes, it has. And my dad is being modest when he says, Oh, I took up running. <laughs> Tell us a little bit. Go ahead and brag about yourself. Tell us about your uh, marathons, triathlons, your rankings right now. Go ahead. Well, I mentioned that humility is one of the characteristics <laughs> prior to practice. Go ahead. Like you can flex a little, Dad. Uh, when I was eight years old, I was ranked um, number two in the whole world for, uh, for uh, Ironman triathlons. When you and were 80. When I was 80, when I was 75, I was ranked number one in the world Wow! Uh, for, for triathlons. And uh, so that's my two biggest achievements. But uh, last year, I was ranked number one in the state of Florida for my age group. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just something I love to do, and it keeps me in shape. And uh, uh, I... Uh, gives me a sense of accomplishment. Mm -hmm. That's that's what I look at over over the years, my accomplishments and having children and raising them and opening up a business and employing people and mm -hmm. and winning a race, you know, that keeps me going. Yeah, of course. And I was a politician too for eight years. You weren't here when I was a politician. You were down in Miami, but that was kind of a uh, odd thing. I mean when you're a politician, you have all these people waiting in line to wine and dine you, i.e. $300 bottles of wine and everything. Oh, gosh. And uh, I say, no, no, I don't want any. And they couldn't, they couldn't believe that I would turn think something like that down. <laughs> and, uh, I just uh, smirk and say, no, nope, I don't need it. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, well, James, James and I call it uh, attractively packaged poison. Yes, yes, it is. You know, yes. and, and the people giving it to you are, we call them smiling assassins. <laughs> <laughs> the ones you taking your work. Yeah. 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 Can I, may I get you a cocktail this evening? You know, and um, what you were saying about, you know, the, the drinking at the end of the races and you being the designated driver, you know, it's amazing when you're alcohol free to look at how it permeates society. Yeah. Like, why would you race, go for a run, race, you know, doing something for your health and then ingest an addictive carcinogen? That makes no sense. No, it doesn't. No, but and it's it, we're brainwashed. We're brainwashed. We are absolutely brainwashed mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. sure. And you, so your company Valiant, um, which I have to brag a little, the V for Victoria, that's where you got the name. Yeah, that's. <laughs> um, but um how many people do you employ and how many years has it been around? Well, I founded the company in my garage uh, uh, right in 1978. And I worked out of there for three years. And then in 1981, I bought a little building, uh, 1,600 square feet and hired a welder and bought some equipment and so forth. And 
So since 1978, I've been in business. That's over 40, 40 years. Mm-hmm. And uh, I have about 90 employees right now, and we do millions of dollars worth of business. Mm-hmm. Our motto is, let's clean China's clock. We try to take <laughs> manufacturing away from China, and we're pretty successful at it. That's right. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a few things when you look back, you know, I mean, first of all, you're 83. If you had continued your path with drinking, I wouldn't have you today. Oh, no. no. Aubrey wouldn't have you. Lauren Kelly and Daniel wouldn't have you. (laughs) Um, You know, so that, I mean, that's the, that's just the reality of it. Alcohol is it, if it has you in its grips, it doesn't want to let go. And like I say to clients, you know, however you're drinking today, in a year, you will drink differently than you do today. You're either going to not drink or you're going to drink more. Mm -hmm. Because it doesn't, it's not a static thing that stays the same. And you know that, and I know that. Um, But when you look at that, you know, you've got 90 employees. Those are 90 families that, Mm -hmm. thanks to you, have employment and the kids Mm -hmm. have food on the table. Um, What does that feel like when you look back on these 40 years of not drinking? What does it feel like? It's got to feel profound. Well, it is. It's a source of, of pride. I mean, uh, we run a we run a good company. We're we're very kind to our employees, and actually, I thank them for our success. I mean, we couldn't have done it without without the employees. Mm-hmm. And um, all the employees know of my background. They know what I struggled with. And um, for example, I won't allow a hat being worn in in the shop with a with a beer ad on the top of it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so they know that they're not going to wear a hat to work with a beer advertisement mm-hmm. on it. Uh, and um, so everybody uh, is very, very aware of, I try to make them aware of alcohol. And if I uh, find somebody or hear somebody in, in our employee, one of the employees who has a drinking problem, uh, we make it a point to intercede and, and do what mm-hmm. we can to help them. And and for the most part, we've been pretty successful. And mm-hmm. um, the people have stayed with us. They sobered up. They understand the importance of being sober mm-hmm. and what it means to their future. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm preaching the gospel when I can. <laughs> oh, I know you <laughs> are. Priority because I yeah. value it so much. Yeah. Yes, it's a valuable thing. And it's great that you have that um, atmosphere in your company. You know, we don't don't have alcohol at the company parties. We're not going to advertise alcohol on our baseball caps. Um, You see it for what it is and you're not shy about sharing it. No, I'm not. Yeah. We don't allow it. That's good. That's good. Um, You know, it's, it was, it was, it was amazing to me when I began to struggle with alcohol. And for our listeners, I thought I knew what a drinking problem looked like. It looked like what I saw when I was young with my dad. And I just figured that anyone who had a drinking problem had always had a drinking problem from the time they took their first drink or something. Um, And imagine my surprise because I went through college and and everything and drank and had a good time and never had any consequences. Didn't really drink during my early mid twenties. Once I graduated and started having children, alcohol wasn't part of my life. Um, so I really thought I had dodged that bullet. I thought, well, that's something that runs on the male side of the family and I'm fine. And, you know, when I started self-medicating, with alcohol for anxiety. I was having anxiety. I didn't know what it was. This was the year 2000 or so. And, um, you know, this, this maladaptive behavior can come in many shapes and forms. So, you know, you have my dad who was, you know, in the service and drinking with his buddies, and then it developed into a problem. He was a business owner. And then you have me, it didn't develop until later. And, I thought I was holding it all together and I had three children. Then I had four children. Um, It's a very insidious 
a problem, addiction. And for anyone listening, if you're questioning, well, is my drinking a problem? I encourage you to not compare your drinking to other people because that was my mistake. And it wasn't, it was just because I didn't know better, but I compared my drinking to what I saw in my father. And the real question is, does this align with my values? Does this drinking habit make me a better version of myself? Do I feel okay about my drinking habits? And if I had had that knowledge that we impart to you all on this podcast and in our coaching program, I probably could have saved myself a lot of suffering. Um, so, you know, if it doesn't feel right to you in your bones, in your skin, then it's not right. It doesn't matter how other people are drinking. It matters how you feel about your drinking. Would you agree with that, Dad? I certainly would. That's well said, <laughs> Donna. Thank you. <laughs> I even uh, did some good serving as a bad example then. So, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I, I say sometimes, I say, well, I'm either an inspiration or a cautionary tale. <laughs> Depends on which part of the journey you saw me on. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but you know, when I when I when I did realize I had an issue, it was it was great to know that um, you know I struggled with with the shame of it going to my dad about it because I thought, oh my gosh, you know, my dad had a problem, and then look at him, he overcame it, and he's this superstar athlete and this county commissioner and business owner, and he's got it all together. <laughs> Um, and I felt a sense of shame, like, oh gosh, I'm going to disappoint him. But just like he said with his employees, when you've been through this, you have that compassion, you know what it's like to be in that struggle. So when I went to my dad, I remember telling you, um, I was in the car at carpool for one of my kids and I told you, and you were a little surprised and then you were very supportive. Yeah. Thank you. I uh, appreciate that. <laughs> Yeah, I knew you, you had it in you. <laughs> yeah. You're a good girl. <laughs> Thank you, Daddy. So for people out there who are listening and they keep waking up in the morning with that shame, with that regret, with those broken promises again, um, what would you say to them? What would I say to them? Mm -hmm. I said, you're getting a message and it's up to you to listen to it. And uh, the life that you have before you without alcohol, it, it's so beneficial. I can't, I can't mention all the times that uh, I just sat back and say, dear God, thank you so much for making me sober yeah. because I'm finally enjoying life. I could, uh, there's so many good things out there to do and to live for and uh, you're just free to do it all. And uh, there's a wonderful life out there. You just have to get rid of that baggage and, and take advantage of it. Yeah. I mean, there's no reason to be the way you are. No sensible reason. Mm -hmm. You just have to get up and, and do something about it, period. Yeah. That's right. What could I say? <laughs> yeah. No, you hit the nail on the head. I mean... You know, like I say to people, and I had to accept this myself, alcohol is a very insidious thing and mm -hmm. it's everywhere in society. So if you drink it, as we're expected to in society, we're expected to drink, drink responsibly, they say, um, but it's an addictive substance. So when you get to a point where you find that you're having problems, it's only a natural progression. That's what happens when you use an addictive substance enough times. So it may not be your fault if you were, like my dad said, brainwashed and took up this mm -hmm. habit, which has now become more than a habit, but it is your responsibility to do something about it. Mm -hmm. and, and you can't do half measures either. I think I, I told you the story, if I have the time to tell it again, about how I decided I was going to give up this beer drinking and this and uh and and whiskey drinking and i was going to be a civilized drinker so i went out <laughs> i bought these little tiny wine glasses 
and uh, I bought this bottle of Champlain or Chavu or whatever kind of wine, <laughs> $23 a bottle. And I came home and set it on the table and filled these little glasses and drank it slowly. Oh, I'm so good. I'm such a, a nice social drinker. This is the way you have to enjoy alcohol. Well, fast forward about two weeks later, I'm, I'm buying Gallo wine for $5 a gallon. I'm mm-hmm. drinking it out of a fruit jar. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's the right. That's the craziness. How many of you out there have tried to drink like a lady or drink like a gentleman? I did the same thing. I would get my fancy glass and pour my nice wine uh, and try to drink like a lady. But that stuff, once it's got you, it's like we want more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We you, want know, more. And, you know, next thing you know, pay a lot like, of money for it either. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, that's the craziness of it. So. You know, I mean, just I hope listening to my dad inspires you. This is a man who, again, was about to give up, was almost resigned to it. Yes, and, I was uh, yeah. ready to give it up. Yep. But instead, he said, well, let me give this thing a shot. And it has not only changed his life, but he is now my mom has passed and he's married to an incredible woman. They have a daughter. Um, he has been such an inspiration and role model for me and my brother, for my kids, for all of his grandchildren, and all those employees, those 90 employees. And they're taking that home to their families. And it affects how those kids are growing up. So again, this, this work is an inside job. But the way that it then goes out into the world is immeasurable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, to our listeners, um, if you are interested in Project 90, please, please, please reach out to us. You can reach me, Victoria, at alcoholfreelifestyle.com. You can click on alcoholfreelifestyle forward slash project 90 to find out more. Uh, You'll be with like-minded people, lots of business owners, like my dad, CEOs, uh, just amazing people, an amazing community. Uh, As you can hear on this podcast, uh, no topic is off limits. We are here to really dig in, do the work, and help you get rid of this. Drop that boulder, like my dad said, and Mm -hmm. uh, get on with your life. Get on Mm -hmm. with the business of, of having fun and enjoying life again. Uh, so anyway, I hope you'll reach out. Thank you, daddy, for being here. I just have one final word of advice, if I may. Yes, sir. This this is to the people who are in a program. They're making progress. They're very pleased with themselves. They could see the light at the end of the tunnel, but just remember this alcohol is evil and you cannot take one drink because you are just one drink away from being a drunk. Yep. So no matter how successful you are, 42 years ago, I still am wary about alcohol. Mm-hmm. I, I fear it. So always have that fear of alcohol, and that will help you go a long ways. Thanks. Thank you, Daddy. All right, guys. Well, again, Bob English, my dad. Thanks for being here, Daddy. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. I want to load you up with some free stuff. If you look in the show description, there's a link there to get my guide, which is the Alcohol Freedom Formula Guide. And in that guide, I will walk you through the process and system for successfully reducing or quitting alcohol. It's the same system and process that I give to my clients inside of Project 90. And if you would like to get your hands on that guide, you can click the link in the description part of this episode, or you can go to alcoholfreelifestyle.com forward slash guide. Likewise, if you would like to be considered for Project 90 to join our community and get some accountability, some coaching and have fun, achieve some goals over at least 90 days with our help and support, then you're invited to schedule a complimentary coaching call with one of my coaches. You can do that by clicking the link in the show description or going to alcoholfreelifestyle.com forward slash schedule. Now, Project 90 is for over 30s only. 
And it's really for people who are ready to get long-term power over alcohol. You don't have to quit forever, but you will have to quit for at least 90 days with our support. Just a reminder, 95% of my content is free and plastered all over the internet. If you just Google James Swanick and the word alcohol, you'll find that. For those of you who want additional support, if you want coaching, fun, accountability, if you realize that you can't do this on your own or you just plain don't want to, then I invite you to schedule that call and we can talk about if Project 90 is for you. If you would like to take some of my supplements, swanvitality.com is the website. I'll put a link in the show notes as well. I have a liver support product called Loving Liver, which I designed and specially formulated to help remove toxins from your liver after years of alcohol consumption. Again, there's a link in the show description. We've also got a green powder there, which turns into a green juice filled with uh, amazing ingredients to support you and give you energy throughout the day. And there's also a magnesium product, which I take every night to help me prepare for sleep and to sleep through the night. So there's a few options there. Lastly, if this episode or the show in general has helped you or supported you in any way, I would so appreciate it if you would write a review. It really does help the show climb the rankings and expose the show to people who don't yet know about us. So if this show has benefited you in any way and you feel compelled to pay it forward, just writing a short little review, hopefully a nice one, will be so appreciated and I will thank you immensely. Lastly, if you'd like to talk to me about anything at all, feel free to send me an email at james at alcoholfreelifestyle.com. I do read and respond to every email. And you can also follow me on Instagram at, at James Swanick. Send me a message there. And I look forward to connecting with you soon. Catch you on the next one.